it's doing. Let's stand up. Stretch a little bit. Get your blood flowing again. And... How's everybody feeling? Okay? Good. All right. Be seated. I'm going to read two uh, passages of Scripture from Mark's Gospel. Um, but actually, before I do that, I want to read this article. Um, I thought <laughs> I shared this today. And I thought it, it kind of fit with some things. So the title of the article is Science Explains What Happens to Someone's Brain from Complaining Every Day. <laughs> so Norman Dodge, a Canadian-born psychiatrist and author of The Brain Changes Itself, says this. He says, thought structure... I'm sorry, thought changes structure. I saw people rewire their brains with their thoughts to cure previously incurable obsessions and trauma. The human brain is remarkably malleable. It can be shaped very much like a ball of Play-Doh, albeit with a bit more time and effort. Within the last 20 years, thanks to rapid development in the spheres of brain imaging and neuroscience, we can now say for certain that the brain is capable of re-engineering and that we are the engineers. In many ways, neuroplasticity, an umbrella term describing the lasting change to the brain throughout a person's life, is a wonderful thing. Here's a few reasons why. We can increase our intelligence. We can learn new life-changing skills. We can recover from certain types of brain damage. We can become more emotionally intelligent. That would be nice, huh? We can unlearn harmful behaviors, beliefs, and habits. On the other side of the coin, we can redesign our brain for worse. Fortunately, thanks to our ability to unlearn harmful behaviors, beliefs, and habits, we can right the ship again. Beliefs change the brain. Donald Hebb, an early pioneer of neuroplasticity and neuropsychology, famously said, neurons that fire together, wire together. Dr. Michael Merzenich, now recognized as perhaps the world's most renowned neuroscientist, built on Hebb's work, proving the relationship between our thoughts, or the neurons that fire, and the structural changes in the brain, how they wire together. Among his numerous discoveries, this one may be the most important. Quote, your experiences, behaviors, thinking, habits, thought patterns, and ways of reacting to the world are inseparable from how your brain wires itself. Negative habits change your brain for the worse. Positive habits change your brain for the better. <clears throat> Neuroplasticity and illness. Consider this quote from Alex Korb, PhD, and author of The Upward Spiral, Using Neuroscience to Reverse the Course of Depression, One Small Change at a Time. He says, quote, in depression, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the brain. <clears throat> it is simply that the particular tuning of neural circuits creates the tendency towards a pattern of depression. It has to do with the way the brain deals with stress, planning, habits, decision-making, and a dozen other things. The dynamic interaction of all those circuits, and once a pattern starts to form, it causes dozens of tiny changes throughout the brain that creates a downward spiral. Neuroplasticity then can both be a problem and a solution. So, complaining and brain changes. We're going to get a bit more specific now, discussing the effects of negative behaviors, specifically complaining, and how these behaviors alter the brain structure. We all know that one, we all know that one person who is continually negative, the person who never seems to be satisfied with anything or anyone. Negative people are almost always complainers without fail. Worse, complainers are not satisfied in keeping their thoughts and feelings to themselves. Instead, they'll seek out some unwilling participant to vent, or in lots of cases, willing participants. It's my little side note there. Undoubtedly, annoying to their friends and family, these quote-unquote Debbie Downers aren't to be chastised, but understood. You see, we all complain from time to time. In fact, researchers from Clemson University empirically demonstrated that everyone grumbles on occasion. Some just do so much more often than others. Complainers generally fall into one of three groups. Attention-seeking complainers, people who seek attention through complaining, always dwelling on about how they've got it worse than everyone else. 
Ironically, rational people are apt to ignore outright the person rather than waste mental energy focusing on their negativity. Chronic complainers. These folks live in a constant state of complaint. If they're not voicing about their woe is me attitude, they're probably thinking about it. Psychologists term this compulsory behavior rumination, defined as repetitively going over a thought or a problem without completion. Rumination is unfortunately directly relayed to the depressed and anxious brain. Then they have what they call low EQ complainers. EQ is short for emotional quotient and constitutes within this group uh, uh, are short on EQ. What IQ is to intelligence, EQ is to emotional understanding. These people aren't interested in your perspective, thoughts, or feelings. You are a sounding board, a brick wall. As such, they dwell and vent at every opportunity. <laughs> so the question is, is the brain to blame? The answer is mostly yes. You see, most negative people don't want to feel that way. Who the hell would? Har that's in the article. That's not my son. <laughs> Harmful behaviors, such as complaining, if allowed to loop within the brain continually, will inevitably alter thought processes. Altered thoughts lead to altered beliefs, which leads to a change in behavior. Our brain possesses a something called the negativity bias. In simple terms, negativity, negativity bias is the brain's tendency to focus more on negative circumstances than positive. Dr. Rick Hansen, a neuroscientist and author of Buddha's Brain, explains the negativity bias. Quote, negative stimuli produce more neural activity than do equally intensive positive ones. They are also perceived more easily and quickly. Repetition is the mother of all learning. When we repeatedly focus on the negative by complaining, we're firing and refiring the neurons responsible for the negativity bias. We are creating our negative behavior through repetition. So final thoughts. It's not possible to be happy-go-lucky all of the time, and we need to try. We should, however, take concrete steps to counteract negative thinking. Research has repeatedly shown that meditation and mindfulness are perhaps the most powerful tools for combating negativity. Positive psychology researcher Barbara Fredrickson and her colleagues at the University of North Carolina showed that people who meditate daily display more positive emotions than those who do not. Following a three-month experiment, Fredrickson's team noted that people who meditated daily continued to display increased mindfulness, purpose in life, social support, and decreased illness symptoms. After learning the basics of meditation, which involve focus on breath, create a meditation schedule that works for you. 15 to 20 minutes of daily meditation is all it takes, and it may make a huge difference in your life and your brain. Interesting, huh? <clears throat> you know, I was, I was reflecting on that before we get into the Bible passages. I need to get a drink of water. <clears throat> and, you know... Um, Psychology is an interesting field because uh, at least the father of modern psychology is considered Sigmund Freud, right? And there were others around that same time. <clears throat> but one of the things that's really interesting about them was they focused on pathologies. Uh, they focused on sick people. <laughs> uh, Freud was a psychiatrist after all, right? So people with pathologies or sickness. And it was Abraham Maslow came along later and said uh, something to the effect of, if you want to, now don't get offended by this, this is not me, this is Maslow, but he, he said, if you want to understand how a car works, you don't go to a junkyard. <clears throat> so, so he changed the focus from pathology, he started interviewing people that were happy and balanced and successful in life <clears throat> to find out how they worked. <clears throat> so he came up with a completely different model of uh, psychology. What's really interesting to me, if you look at all the self-help literature today and you compare it to self-help literature from the early to mid parts of <clears throat> the 20th century, actually the mid, middle part of the 20th century after the, uh, the Great Depression, most of it is uh, focused on the power of positive thinking, that kind of stuff. And then that kind of got derailed a little bit culturally, and you don't see as much of that in self-help literature, but if you go back and you study the self-help literature, particularly after the Depression, one of the people was Napoleon Hill, wrote a book called Think and Grow Rich, 
and, what, and he's written some other amazing stuff as well, but Think and Grow Rich is the one that's the most well-known. But what he did kind of the same thing as Maslow. He went and studied people who had been successful about their thinking patterns and thought habits and that kind of thing, and then constructed, here's the basic foundational principles that everyone that he interviewed had in common in terms of their success. And it was being able to focus on the positive. Now, what that article is saying is that we have a negativity bias, <clears throat> which science tells us, you know, would come from the days when we were living in caves or whatever and having to worry about <clears throat> lions and bears and whatever, that it was crucial to your survival to focus on that which was negative, right? So your brain just has a greater propensity still for focusing on the negative. Our problem is, is that most of what we complain about or focus on is not life-threatening. <laughs> but you still have the same faculties going on in the brain. So just a little encouragement to be, uh, maybe make a decision or renew a commitment to try to complain less and be more of a positive person and positive thinker. So that's, that's all that is. Now let's look at, this. Let's look at uh, a couple passages because I want to continue to talk about manifesting change in your life, positive change. <clears throat> so in Mark chapter 5, verse 25, we have the, the story of the woman with the issue of blood. And it says, now a certain woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians and she had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment for she said... If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Now, in the original Greek language there, it doesn't say, for she said, like one time, if I may only touch the, his clothes, I shall be made well. It says that uh, the way it's constructed in the Greek, it is very repetitive. So it actually says in the original language, for she said and kept saying to herself, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But the disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. So Jesus is telling her right here. He didn't say my power, my greatness, God. He basically tells her as plain as he can tell her, your faith made you well. You did something. You created your own wellness. You created your own healing by your faith. You did it. He gives her total credit for it. All right. You don't hear that enough today. Jesus does that in several places where he gives the person credit or at least their faith credit for creating the new circumstance that they're experiencing. You hear the exact opposite today. You, you, you've got to, and I know I'm going to touch on a, a touchy thing here, but we hear, you know, something like that happens. You have to give all the glory to God, which is disempowering because it takes it away from you and puts it off on God. And here's the thing. I just don't believe God is that egotistical that he just needs that or that he's in any way threatened. And Jesus didn't do that. He didn't say all glory to me or all glory to God. He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Now go and be, go and be well. Right? <clears throat> we'll see the same thing again in, in uh, Mark 11. 23, Jesus said, for assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Now, nowhere in there does he say, pray and ask God to move the mountain. <laughs> nowhere in there does he say God's going to move the mountain. He says, if you speak to the mountain, right? So the woman did what? She said and she kept on saying, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made well. Then Jesus said, if you say to the mountain, if you say to the mountain, be removed, cast into the sea, and you do not doubt in your heart, but you believe that those things which you say will happen, you will have whatever you 
say. So is that something God does or is that something that we do? Clearly, that's something that we do. So people get upset all the time because they feel like God didn't answer their prayers. Uh, you know, prayed for somebody and they died or prayed for whatever and God didn't do something. But the issue is it's not about God doing something. Right? Now, here's the key. Verse 24. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray... Believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now again, a little bit of a nuance in the Greek that's not brought out. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, the King James says, whatever things you desire when you pray, believe that you have already received them and you shall have them. I want you to notice what Jesus does with time here. Because really when you get right down to it this whole thing is about time when you look at the story of the woman with the issue of blood she'd had it for the bible points out 12 years and here's her experience <laughs> she went to many physicians she spent all that she had and instead of getting better she did what she became worse so she's stuck in a pattern or a cycle that keeps repeating itself and her history for 12 years is every time I attempt, because here, see, here's the thing you got to understand. Every time she went to a new physician, she went in hope. Or she wouldn't have spent what she had. Every time she went to a physician, she was trying to create a new future. And every time she tried to create that new future in hope, it didn't happen. <laughs> so repetitive failures so let's talk about time a little bit what if what if time doesn't really exist or at least what if time doesn't exist like we think it does what if time primarily at least from this perspective is a perception it is the mind's way of organizing listen to this very carefully it's the mind's way of organizing the instability of this universal form that we, live, that we live in and polarity. Here's what I mean by that. Everything is changing. You know, one definition of insanity that we hear all the time is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Another definition of insanity might be expecting permanency in a world that is not permanent. In other words, everything is constantly changing. You never step into the same river twice, right? And life is kind of that way. So as we are moving through space, as we are moving through a world that is, is, constant, is, a, is a constant variable. So for example, in, in the next moment, I could do any number of things. There are any number of possibilities. I could keep talking about what I'm talking about, I could change the subject. I could scratch my nose, move my hands. I could stop talking. I could sit down. I could say, hey, let's take a break. I've got to go to the bathroom. I could do any number of those things. Any one of those possibilities is available to me. And whatever I do, because you're here and you're listening to me and you're watching this, whatever, it's going to change your experience. So there really is, on a very small level, nothing very stable. <laughs> Make sense? because there are so many potential possibilities, which is a good thing because that means you can create something different. But that also means that everything is always subject to change and everything is always changing. So therefore our mind needs a way to cope with that and needs a way to understand what we perceive to be cause and effect. Are, are you breathing? Are you staying with me? So we create a timeline in our mind or a concept of past, present, future that is primarily built on the changing aspects of what's going on around us and our perception of how those events interact in relationships of cause and effect. So important to understand that because this is where we mess up in faith. 
See, Jesus said, if you don't doubt in your heart, I promise you every doubt you've ever had does not exist in the present moment. It exists somewhere in your perception where your mind is going back to the past or projecting into the future. If you're sitting there thinking, this isn't going to happen, then you are projecting into the future. You're looking into your crystal ball and assuming you know what's going to happen, therefore you're doubting. Or you're thinking perhaps like maybe this lady had to overcome about all the unanswered prayers that you've had in the past and all the times it didn't work for you in the past or so-and-so that you knew and it didn't work for them and so-and-so tried it and they died or whatever. And so your, your, mind, your consciousness is going back into the past. And it's from that place then that doubt is given birth to. So therefore, that's, that's one reason this whole thing is connected to time. The other reason is, is because the way you file time in your brain, in your mind, is based on your perception of cause and effect. Think about it. I'm here today because of what I did in the past. Simple. I'm here right now because I got up, got dressed, got in my car, whatever, all of those things were causes to get to the effect of me being here. And that's how I store it in my mind. So you get it? So that's kind of a basic concept. Now here's the other thing about the way you store time in your brain. You store time in packages. Periods, seasons, episodes. And here's the other thing. You only really store in your brain over a long period of time emotionally significant events. You're not going to walk out of here and remember, oh, well, he moved his hands this way or he stood here or moved over here. You see what I mean? Like, like your brain isn't going to necessarily recall all those various different events. If I were to pick some random day... Uh, January 23rd, 2007. What were you doing on January 23rd, 2007? You won't have a clue unless there was an emotionally significant event. Your child was born on that day, or someone had passed away on that day, or something. If I said, uh, where were you uh, at 8 a.m. on those of you that are yeah, most of us. Uh, where were you? <laughs> On 9-11. I don't even have to say the date. I mean, I am 9-11, but that could mean anything, right? But if I say, where were you? On September 11th. Don't even have to get the year. You can remember instantly, right? I remember instantly where I was. I mean, I remember details. Why? Because of the emotional significance of the event. Why was it emotionally significant? Because of the massive amount of change that occurred in that moment that we mentally and emotionally had to process. Does this make sense to you? So then what we create for ourselves is a timeline. In other words, our life is going a certain direction and we mentally and emotionally, for the most part, support and maintain that direction with our habits. Our habits of thinking, our habits of feeling, our mental and emotional programming, our behaviors, our speech. So we're supporting that timeline and moving towards a outcome. What faith does is gives you the ability to branch off the timeline that you're on and create a new one. Create a whole new flow of life that takes you in a completely different direction than where you've been going. This lady had had this issue of blood for 12 years. She'd been to many physicians, she tried many things, but she wasn't better, instead she grew worse. So what is the flow of her timeline? See it? But when she heard of Jesus, 
Something diverges. You can almost picture it like a branch growing off of a tree trunk. Something diverges, and she begins to say to herself, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. Now, you know she's got to be seeing that. So repetitively, she's seeing that. She's experiencing that, at least in the realm of her imagination, before it happens. So that she's actually creating a new timeline over here. Now, what happens if she gets to Jesus, touches him, and nothing happens? That branch of time, if you will, collapses. That potential possibility and reality does not become stabilized. And she moves back into the more stabilized pattern of having the issue of blood and continual disappointment. So the issue of faith is to create a new timeline and do it in such a way that it becomes stable enough that the old timeline is the one that collapses into the new. Which is why when Jesus is teaching here on faith and prayer, he messes up completely your concept of time. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray in that moment, so we could call that the present. When you pray. Uh, Hebrews 11 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. <laughs> Hope exists in the future. <laughs> faith always exists in the present moment. Which is why doubt has to rely on past or future in order to get root in your life. So one of the real keys to this is being able to be present mentally in the moment. See it? Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you have already received it in the past, and you shall have it in the future. So in other words, you have to believe it happened before it actually happens. But not just in the moment, you have to believe that it happened in the past. <laughs> Think how much that, that jacks with your sense of time. Think what a knot it puts it in. <laughs> Think what it does to your ideas of cause and effect. You see the same thing in John chapter 9 when the disciples asked Jesus, who sinned this man in a previous life or his parents that he was born blind? And what does Jesus say? See, they're looking at cause and effect. Who sinned this man in a previous life because he was born blind or his parents generational curse cause that he was born blind effect they're looking to the past what how does jesus answer neither this man nor his parents sin but that the glory of god might be revealed in him so what jesus was doing was he was pointing to a time in the man's future when he would encounter the christ as the cause for why he was born blind. So he's placing cause in the future rather than in the past. See it? So that maybe what sometimes is directing your life has nothing to do with your past because it's all an illusion anyway. It's all a perception of change. That's why it's important to understand it doesn't really exist in the way that we think it does. But what if some of what's happening in your life has nothing to do with your past it has to do with a future that has been set up for you that you are being pulled into that's actually the cause of what's going on now and not something that happened back then but what jesus is saying here is is he's he's, he's actually trying to get you off the timeline of past present future by saying in the present believe something happened in the past so that you can have it in the future so literally what he's saying is, 
create a different timeline. See, how, how many of you have ever made a mistake, wish you could go back in time and fix it? Like, if you haven't, you're not even human. I, 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 don't, I don't even want to talk to you. <laughs> it's like, go away, don't come back. For the rest, because this is for the rest of us. How many of you have made, made a mistake and you wish you could go back in time and fix it or correct it? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Jesus is kind of offering you the opportunity to do that. But different than we think. See, we think if I can go, I would be here if I hadn't done that, or if that hadn't happened, or if I could talk to my younger self and do something different, then I'd be in a different place, right? So literally what we would try to do, and they make movies about this and all kinds of stuff, is go back into time and meet that 19-year-old me or 20-year-old me or 30-year-old me or whatever-year-old me and say, hey, dummy, <laughs> you're messing things up and this isn't going to go so good and you need to do this. And then, and then th this person at that moment chooses a different arrangement of possibilities and starts going in a different direction. And then what happens? That timeline vanishes and a new one becomes established. You, do, you, do you see it? You see it? So Jesus is saying in prayer, you can essentially do the same thing, but what you do is you don't go in the past and fix it. You construct the future the way you want it. Then you throw it in the past with your consciousness, with your mind. It is very different. Now, just to like illustrate, because... It's hard for us to get this because it's such a mind blower. On purpose, it's a mind blower. Because here's what Jesus is saying. So let's say this bottle represents my answer to prayer that I want. And we're going to make Nick God. And I'm petitioning Nick. Now the way most people pray is, they're going to ask for something, and they will believe that God answered that prayer when they actually see the change manifest before their eyes. So don't give me the bottle right now. So this is how I pray. Uh, God, could I have that bottle? God, could I please have that bottle? God, could I please, 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 please have that bottle? I don't know. Let's get some people to agree. Uh, Jeanette, would you agree with me that God will give me that bottle? Pam, come on. Pray with me that God will give me that bottle. Let's see if we can get on some more prayer lists and see how many people we can get to agree that maybe if we vote enough, because we live in a democratic society, if we get enough votes, then because we think God's like whatever, Congress, or I don't know what we think. <laughs> Who knows? Okay, then go ahead. So then I said, God, give me the bottle. And then at that moment... Oh my gosh, I have the bottle. What, what do I stand on? I say, God answered my prayer today. When did God answer my prayer? Today. Well, what about all the other 99 times that you prayed? I don't know about that, but he, he answered it today. Because I got it. Now, here's another approach. The other approach would be, believe you receive when you pray. So, God, give me the bottle. I, I got it. Now, I don't have any evidence of it. So, you, the, the illustration breaks down. I don't actually have it yet. But I believe I received it when I prayed the prayer. So, I believe I'm receiving it right now. So, thank you for answering my prayer. And I walk out and think, okay, now I'm waiting for it to show up. You got it? Mm -hmm. So that it's still in my future. Right. So, imagine... My timeline, future's there, past is back there, right? So in the one way, I'm going through my timeline, praying, 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 praying. It shows up, boom, I got it now. Not back six months ago when I started praying. Another way to do it is, okay, I believe I receive it now. Okay, I don't have it, but I believe that I received it when I prayed, right? But that's not even what Jesus is talking about. Because the nuance in the Greek is, believe it already happened in the past. So in other words, I desire the water. God, give me the water. I take it, not in this moment. I go back and put it somewhere in my past. 
and believe that it's already occurred. That's the only way to create an, a new timeline, a new branch that is sustainable. Now, what did I tell you about time and the past? It has to be emotionally significant. If it's not emotionally significant, it has no ability to branch out a new timeline. So you cannot, how do I say this? Don't overuse this. If you overuse this, then you end up trying to store all the different movements, gestures, hand gestures that I made today, rather than maybe the main point of what you got that spoke to you at some kind of an emotional level that you take away from the talk. Now, at the same time, you need to practice this method a little bit. So like I suggested last week, don't start with a million dollars. Start with $10. <laughs> I'm going to find $10. Right? And then you see yourself, you create it, you visualize it inside yourself. You make it as a live, uh, yeah, as a live, sen as sensory, involve as much senses as possible. So I see it, oh, it feels a little wrinkled or it feels crisp and new. I don't know if you want to smell money, but you know. <laughs> smell that money. You, you get the point, right? I got it. See, so you have to develop your imaginative capacities. That's what this woman was doing. When she said and kept on saying, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. Think about that. She, when she heard of Jesus, so there's the hearing. She's got to be seeing him in her mind's eye, but she's also touching him. It's becoming very alive sensory. Imagination isn't just about making pictures with your mind. So you develop that. I can see it. I can, I can enter into a whole movie of I have it. It's there. I know what it feels like, this new reality that I'm creating. I know what it, it smells like. I know what it sounds like. I know what it looks like. And I'm creating it in the theater of my imagination. I'm creating it in the theater of my consciousness. And it has to be emotionally compelling enough that it would become a lasting memory. So I'm putting emotion into it. So if you could imagine it like this, you're literally creating something with the substance of consciousness. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. <laughs> the evidence of things not seen. So what's your evidence? I can see it. I can hear it. I can feel it. I can experience it, right? Mm -hmm. and it's still, but it's still in my future. But that's a necessary part. Watch this. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So you have to create a compelling vision that gives you hope, which is what the woman with the issue of blood was doing. But now see, Jesus was getting ready to leave the planet. So you notice Mark eleven twenty three 23 is right before Jesus is taken uh, that last week of his life. Why is he teaching them that principle of faith? Because he's no longer going to be the conduit. The, he's no longer going to be the, the channel that they could touch. So how do they do it with him not there? Now there has to be this added component of believing that you received it in the past. So that's the next part. So I create this compelling idea, this compelling image, this emotionally significant future for myself. Because again, you're breaking off a whole new timeline, so it's gotta have some teeth to it. It's gotta have some oomph. If it doesn't, it's not gonna work. 
It's going to collapse. And that's what happens. It's, it's like it's not solid inside of us. We're not totally committed. We're not even sure we want it. I've told you guys this before, but it, it's really, it makes the point. You know, when Powerball first came out, we're like younger in our faith and thinking, okay, how can we use this to influence the, the balls, you know, that draw for however that works or whatever. And, and, and we really, you know, but the most interesting thing happened because the more we created this reality in our imagination of having all this wealth, the more problems we saw. As long as it's just an idea and you think, oh, I'll give money here and I'll do this and I'll, uh, and oh, my problems will be solved and I'll quit my job and blah, 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 blah. It's just airy-fairy. But when you start really creating it in your mind, what's it going to be like to be super rich? And you start thinking about all the pressure and all the people and all the stress and all, and everything is going to call. And then pretty soon we're like, eh, I don't think we want that. Our life ain't too bad. Let's don't mess with it. So what happened? That timeline collapses, but it collapses because it's not really what you want. And, you know, I, I love some of the, these guys in Hollywood, what they're doing right now. Um, Russell Brand, I, I love some of the stuff he's putting out on YouTube. Um, but Jim Carrey, I, I just love it because he used these principles. I mean, if you know the story, he wrote out a check for $8 million and he would go and stand on, you know, one of the hills there in Hollywood and he would just prophesy out to Hollywood that everybody there wanted to work with him and every producer wanted to work with him. And he was seeing it and imagining it, building, building it, building it, building it. And then it happened. Right? He had that check, I think, on his refrigerator where he'd written it out, you know, like it was pretend, but, you know. And then what happened was he realized that that did nothing to satisfy what he really wanted. That he got to the pinnacle of it and realized, I didn't want any of this. None of this is what I really wanted. And then he had a spiritual awakening. So sometimes we go through that in this process where we realize this isn't really what I want. And when that happens, that new timeline that you've been creating, it just whew, vanishes. Or if it doesn't have the, the teeth, the emotional oomph, something else comes along in this ever-changing world and you're off to something else. You're off on some other project now or some other thought or, oh, I wish this would happen or, well, that didn't happen fast enough, so now I wish this would happen. So what happens? That timeline collapses. Is this making sense to you? So that those potential futures never occur. But then here's the real key. Once you've made it compelling, at some point, once you can see it, you can taste it, you can smell it, you can, at some point, you, you've created a time package. Because remember I said you, you store it in packages? You've created a time package. Now you've got to take that in your consciousness and you've got to move it and tuck it away as though it's something that already occurred in your past. And when you can do that, then now you've introduced that new reality into your timeline. Why? You did it like a virus, like a little Pac-Man that can begin to munch away at the timeline that you've been experiencing so that this new one collapses and then something happens. All of a sudden, synchronicities start to happen where coincidences begin to bring you into the reality that you believed that you already received. And then you shall have it. And here's the number one thing that messes us up other than being in the past or the future with our doubts, the number one thing that messes us up, how is it going to happen? And the moment I entertain with my mind how it's going to happen and start planning and thinking and all that stuff is the moment that I move back onto this timeline and I'm trying to make it happen. Which, so what happens? This one collapses. So in order to operate in faith, it has to be real, it has to be compelling, you have to believe that you've received it, and you cannot touch with your thought life, how is this going to happen? You cannot ruminate or worry about or think about, how is this going to happen? You completely let the how go. In fact, in some of the more ancient ways of doing this, this technology 
for doing this has been around forever, since the time of Christ and before. Some of the more ancient ways of doing it, they had a way of putting it in the subconscious and almost forgetting about it. They would have methods where they would, they would create ways to symbolize that new reality and they would put it, they would do it in such a way that they're in a moment of intense emotion, there'd be impact. And then they would create the experience in such a way that they would forget about it. So that they weren't destroying it by ruminating over how's it going to happen. All right. Does that make sense? Okay, I hope that helps you somehow. <laughs> But again, people come in and they say, well, we don't know how to pray anymore. It's okay to pray. It's okay to talk to God. It's okay to ask for things to happen. But when you have a major issue, like the lady with the, with the issue of blood, or you want something, you're not dependent upon, you know, whatever kind of mood you think God's in that day, whether or not he's going to give it to you. You create it through the faith of your own consciousness, the future that you want. Put it in the past. Don't worry about how. You'll have it. All right. God bless you. Have a great day. <laughs>